Hello, welcome to my channel, another Bibliophile Reads. My name is Greg, and I am here to do the second installment of my library tour of I Like Big Books. My previous tour was novels only, and today I am doing nonfiction. So, let's see what I have. In order of length, at number 14, A Sorrow in Their Hearts, The Life of Tecumseh, by Alan W. Eckert. This is the, the Indian war chief who died in 1813. Um, I don't know anything about this book. I don't know where I picked it up other than I picked it up. And it is 1,068 pages long. Number 13, Faulkner, American Writer by uh, Frederick R. Carl. Now, I have always liked the author Faulkner, and um, I picked this up as a biography. I have not read this. Um, I, I looked online once about different biographies and what people thought. Um, this one does not come in as a very highly rated biography, and I just know nothing. I'm trying not, not to make this uh, shine my Mylar cover, and that is 1,132 pages. Um, I might try to read this one day just because I really like Faulkner and it's the only biography that I am. Coming in at number 12, it's a bit of a surprise at only 1,246 pages. And this is The Power Broker by Robert R. Caro. And this is, of course, uh, Robert Moses in the Fall of New York City. This might be one of the best biographies that I have ever read. Um, it is about a builder in New York, and this builder just had untold amount of power in New York City during the, the first parts of the um, 20th century and in, into the, the mid 20th century. Um, and, and Caro just goes into amazing amounts of details about Moses and how he used power. And a lot of readers get very frustrated because they think he's going into too much detail. But I did um, read one of his uh, autobiographical essays where he describes his process is that he wants you to know exactly how this man used power. And the, one of the most uh, telling episodes is when he was building the, the Long Island Freeway. Um, he would divert that freeway when it was built to avoid rich people's estates. But when it came to a poor person's farm, he did not divert it. And it would have been very easy and at a very minimum cost to divert it when he was when it was first brought to his attention. But he didn't do it because that farmer had no money to give Robert Moses. And the author goes into painstakingly details of how that that freeway broke through the middle of this farmer's yard lawn, um, not lawn, uh, property, and he had to spend a half hour going around this freeway to get to the rest of his farming spaces. And um, it was just devastating for that farmer. And again, one of the best biographies that I've ever read. Next comes at number 11 at 1,283 pages, the complete essays of uh, Montaigne. Um, I have read selected essays out of this collection. I have not read the whole collection. At number 10, Imperial by William T. Volman. Now this is about basically illegal immigration before Donald Trump came to power. Um, it is a very interesting look at the border and how people immigrate. Um, it is a huge book. As I said, it's um, it? uh, 1,306 pages long. Um, and, and Volman is very exhaustive, a lot like Robert Caro. He just goes into an amazing amount of detail. Um, I read this over a week. I found it utterly fascinating. It might be interesting to look at this book again now that um, immigration is even a bigger uh, bet noir than it was when it was written. Number nine, The Anatomy of Melancholy by Robert Burton. This is 1,000, 
382 pages long. I have not read much of this. I've read brief selections. And what's curious about this edition is that it is originally published as three volume. And this publisher decided they weren't going to reformat any of the printing. So if you look here, right about there, it says page 523. You flip to the second part over here and you see again, it starts page two and three. So all I did was add up all those pages together and I came up with um, 1,382 pages for this book. After that is the collected works of, dia the collected dialogues of Plato. Um, that is uh, number eight at 1,743 pages long. I have read a good selection of the dialogues out of this work. Um, I have not read everything. Um, I've read some of the works in different editions when I was in uh, college, like the Republic. But uh, when I got this in the 90s, I was going through from the very beginning, trying to read every dialogue. And I got through maybe a third before life got in the way. And one day I want to go back and finish reading all of Plato. And Plato is one of my favorite philosophers. I don't think his philosophies are actually accurate all the time, but I like it because it's a way of thought. It's a way of life. It's, a, it's looking at life philosophically is what the important lesson is that I get out of Plato. The next one, number seven, Questioning Minds, edited by Edward M. Burns. And this is the letters of Guy Davenport and Hugh Kenner. Massive series of books here. Um, I'm not real familiar with any of these two authors, but what happened was I was listening to a podcast called um, Bookworm by Michael Silverblatt, and he had the editor discussing this book. And after I listened to them discuss this book, I just decided I have to own this book, um, mostly because by the time I want to get around to reading it, it's going to be out of print and very expensive. And I only paid like 80 bucks for this one. So pretty good deal. After that, that was number seven. Number six, Children of the Pride, edited by Robert Manson Myers. And this is Selected Letters from a Southern Family During the Civil War. And if you look at the page, um, last page of volume three, you can see it is 1,843 pages long. Um, I have not read this, but the, the author was a professor at the University of Maryland where I went to school and he taught um, uh, the, the, the junior English class, junior composition, and he was beyond doubt, one of the worst professors I have ever had. Um, I took it as a summer class where you basically go for four weeks and you go every day. And all this professor would do is sit and bloviate all day long. He would assign you a topic of a paper on day one, that was on Monday. And when you come in on Friday, you're supposed to turn in your paper on his subject. Other than that, it was bloviate, bloviate, bloviate. The, the main lesson I remember is he says, if you were at a, a, a fancy party in England and the hostess brings out her fine china and you break her fine china, what do you do? You tell her you're sorry because the hostess knows that her china will be broken someday if she uses it. That is what I learned in this English composition class. Oh, he also told me not to make spelling mistakes. Um, I never learned that lesson. Um, number five, the complete works of Aristotle. This is a lot like Plato. I have read selected works of Aristotle out of here. I have not read the whole collection. Um, I sort of put, you know, Plato and Aristotle in the same bucket of great philosophers they should read and study, but not necessarily take their philosophy to heart because... Aristotle can be wrong sometimes. Then number five. Oh, I'm sorry, that is number four. 
oh, and Aristotle was 2,478 pages. Now this is Zimbaldon by Guillaume Leopardali at 2,502 pages. Now physically, this is the largest single volume nonfiction work that I own. I read about the thir first 30 pages and was just baffled. Now part of that bafflement is um, that he's talking so much about Italian people in his day and age, and I just didn't know any of them. Um, I remember Steve Donahue talking about this book and saying when he wrote this, the author had basically a mental disease, which he could not stop writing. Um, I think that might be an accurate description. At number three, now this is where I have to get a little bit funky with pages, but this is Rising Up and Rising Down by William T. Volman. This, although is in seven volumes, it is considered a single work. And this is his study of violence and what justifies the use of violence. Um, I did read the first volume and I decided that I needed a lot more time to devote to that book. And it's just not something you can sit down and read like you would read a normal book. It would take a lot of study and a lot of effort to get through that. So now that I'm retired, I, I do have to make time for this. Maybe not this year, but maybe 2023. And the total number of pages is 3,250. Now again, for the next long book, I it was originally published in individual volumes. And this is the history, or A History of Philosophy by Frederick Coulson, S.J. Um, again, this is a work where it was originally three individual works that they have printed together in one volume. Now this single volume is more than 1,000 pages long, as is both other volumes. And um, I'm considering this as one giant work of history and not necessarily a lot of individual works. And when you do that, you come up with 3,385 pages for a history of philosophy. Now that is a lot of philosophy to go over. And oddly enough, the longest work I have in nonfiction would be The Rise and the Fall of the Roman Empire. Now, this is a box set. Each individual volume of Gibbon is, again, over 1,000 pages long. So they're individually very long books. And um, taken together, they are 3,675 pages long. Um, I have not read this. Um, I've read some very brief excerpts from Gibbon. It is something I really want to get to one day, but who knows when I'll get to it. So that is my collection of large nonfiction works. This will not be the last uh, video of large books. I still have um, comp comp compilation books that are collected works, and I will show that in another video. Thank you for watching. Have a good day. Goodbye.